I'd, I'd really like to thank Terry Allard and her staff and everyone at PBS and the community idea stations uh, for putting this event together this evening. I think it's just a terrific event. Um, and I'd also like to thank the uh, Lighthouse Studios and the Vinegar Hill Theater for hosting us tonight. So as we celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 11 mission, there's so much that I'd like to talk to you about. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have enough time to go through all the stories. When I was a young boy, I was one of those young kids that was absolutely fascinated by the space program. I was fascinated by rockets. I was fascinated by spacecraft. I idolized the astronauts. I was fascinated by the work that they did on their missions. And by the way, I'm a huge fan of the Apollo Lunar Surface Journal. For anyone who doesn't know what the Apollo Lunar Surface Journal is, it is a minute-by-minute minute or literally second-by-second second transcript of every word that was said by everybody on the surface of the moon, including mission control and the astronauts. Um, if you've never seen it, you've really got to look at it because they correlate it with the mission timelines and the photographs and the pictures and every single thing they did. Um, I've read it all from beginning to end. <laughs> so, so that's what a big fan I am of the Apollo missions. Um, it, it's, uh, I use on a regular basis technology that is directly descended from the Apollo missions. But of all these things, the missions, the equipment, the astronauts, there's just too much to do in a single evening. So I thought tonight on the 50th anniversary, it's probably better to spend a few minutes talking more about the legacy of Apollo than any of the individual stories. Although if anyone has a question or anything, I'm sure some of the panelists, um, Larry was there for many of these great stories. Uh, and we can talk about those stories later. But tonight I plan to talk a little bit about the legacy of the Apollo missions. And not just the technological legacy, which we've all heard about before many times, but also the political, the managerial, the scientific, and even the inspirational legacies of Apollo. So the first, and I think by far the foremost legacy of the Apollo missions is actually a political legacy. As I'm sure you know, the Apollo missions were a proxy war in the Cold War. The primary reason for sending an astronaut to the moon and returning him safely to Earth was to restore the prestige and the national pride of the United States. The Apollo missions were conceived in 1961 in the immediate aftermath of the national embarrassment that the Soviet Union had once again, and again unexpectedly, beaten the United States in a significant space first. And at that time, it was launching the first man into orbit. The primary political purpose for Apollo was to demonstrate the technological superiority of the United States and to restore its national prestige by beating the Soviets in the next milestone in the space race, which was landing a man on the moon. With the success of the Apollo 11 mission in July of 1969, we completed John F. Kennedy's 1961 challenge to the nation just six months before the deadline that he had set. And after that, the political legacy of Apollo was an outstanding success. It's interesting to think that it's now 50 years after that first landing on the moon, but images of astronauts standing on the moon are still an enduring symbol of the power and prestige of the United States, even though it's an accomplishment that we did 50 years ago. I think another political legacy of Apollo was demonstrating what our country could do when we came together under a single vision, regardless of part of the political party or affiliation. At the very beginning of Chasing the Moon, and we're not going to see this segment tonight because the segment we're going to see tonight comes from uh, much later in Chasing the Moon. But in the very first minute of Chasing the Moon, Walter Cronkite comes on and he says, it shows what this, the richest nation in history, can do when it puts its mind to it. It is remarkable to realize that the Apollo program continued under three presidents, Kennedy, Johnson, and Nixon, from both sides of the political aisle. At the time of the first lunar landing in 1969, almost none of the political leaders that originally conceived and put Apollo in process eight years earlier were still in power. And yet our nation persisted in, in this pursuit, um, even in the, in the face of changing political ties. And it's this legacy from which I think we need to draw lessons if this nation is to accomplish great things in space in the future. Over the last 40 years, I followed the space program closely. And in that time, I've seen us set the goal of going to Mars, shift that goal to focusing on near-Earth space with the International Space Station, shift again to focusing on Mars, shift to focusing on visiting an asteroid, capturing it, and bringing it back to Earth, and now we've shifted back to going to the moon, maybe, 
by 2024 as an initial step to a human exploration of Mars maybe. These significant changes in direction in the last 40 years, with every presidential administration, have resulted in a fitful stop and go, and I think frankly wasteful squandering of time, people, money, and resources at NASA. As for the current goal of returning to the moon by 2024 and Mars in the 2030s or 2040s, I'm pessimistic that NASA can accomplish these goals without a significant and sustained increase in funding. And I'm pessimistic that we as a nation are willing to commit those resources. Without stable goals, significant funding, and national support, I have a foreboding sense that NASA will again, with the next presidential administration, find itself starting over with a new goal and a new mission. I think the second legacy of Apollo, and it's one that I think is greatly underappreciated, is the fact that Apollo was the, was the successful management of the largest, most costly, most complex civilian construction program since the Panama Canal. I would argue since then we have not done a civilian construction program as large as Apollo. It's even more remarkable to think that all of that was done in the period of just eight years. During Apollo, NASA had to develop from scratch new models and methods of project management, fiscal administration, systems engineering, and systems integration. Interestingly, according to the NASA historian Roger Launius, James Webb, who was the NASA administrator at the height of the program, always contended that Apollo was much more a management exercise than anything else, and that the technological challenge, while sophisticated and impressive, was largely within grasp at the time of the 1961 decision. The management achievements weren't easy, just to make the case that these management decisions were significant and were very difficult, it's, it's important to realize that they came at very great cost. Um, the loss of astronauts Grissom, White, and Chaffee in the Apollo 1 fire in 1967 were a direct result of poor project management and oversight. NASA was eventually able to uh, acquire, organize, and efficiently utilize the resources required to complete one of the most amazing technological feats in human history. And I really do think the management of the Apollo program stands as one of its great legacies. Looking forward again, it's not clear to me if this legacy of outstanding management and leadership in a large civilian government program is what's needed for the next steps, which are a return to the moon and possibly a human exploration of Mars. I think times have changed. Our government borders on dysfunction, and the citizens don't seem to have the will for a massive program like Apollo. I'm encouraged, however, that visionary individuals and visionary companies are taking up the challenge. I would not be at all surprised if the first footsteps on Mars come not from an enormous government project, but from a small, nimble, private company that has vision. The next legacy that I want to talk about briefly, and I'll only mention this one briefly, is the technological legacy, because this is the one that we've all heard the most about. Historians at the Armstrong Air and Space Museum in Wapakoneta, Ohio, point out that Apollo bequeathed to us an expansive list of practical inventions and technical spin-offs that revolutionized how we live today. Athletic shoes, computer chips, conditioning and sports equipment, cooling suits, co uh, cordless power tools, flame-resistant textiles, freeze-dried foods, joysticks, installation, yeah, sorry, insulation, life support systems, lubricants, measurement techniques, medical diagnostic machines, memory foam, recycling fluids, reflective materials, safety systems, spacesuit technologies, just to name a few. It's this technological legacy of Apollo that is most often cited in justifying the immense effort and cost of the Apollo program. It may be that many of these technological innovations would have happened in time. They would have come about regardless of the Apollo program. Nevertheless, the Apollo program hastened their use and provided valuable financing to a uh, nascent semiconductor industry uh, at its beginning. Former NASA flight director Glenn Lunny once stated that Apollo really did drive our industry. We were asking people to do things that were probably 10 to 20 years faster than they otherwise would have done. And they knew it. They stepped up to it and they succeeded. Today's cell phones, wireless equipment, iPads, and so on are the result of the fact that the country did this high-tech thing and created this large portfolio of available technologies. In terms of scientific legacy, the Apollo missions to the moon revolutionized our view of the early history of our solar system. 
Due to the fact that the moon doesn't have an atmosphere, it has no erosion from wind, nor rain, nor ice. And the moon is small and cooled off long ago, so it's geologically dead. And these factors together mean that the lunar surface is a fossil of the early solar system. And by a fossil of the early solar system, I mean that it records events that happened at the very beginning of the formation of the planets in our solar system. Those same things happened on Earth, but they've been erased by billions of years of plate tectonics, wind, rain, and ice erosion. So from this history, we were able to count craters on the surface of the moon. And we were able to use samples returned by the astronauts to determine the ages of those surfaces and those terrains where the craters occurred. So we were able to determine from these crater counts and surface age estimates the rate at which craters have been striking bodies in the solar system for the last four and a half billion years. From this, we discovered that the early solar system was an extraordinarily violent place. In fact, the first 700 million years of our solar system was an extremely violent time. The lunar samples that were brought back by the astronauts revolutionized our view of the formation of the moon. Before the lunar missions, scientists had three primary ideas of where our moon came from. And it was hoped that the samples brought back from the moon would determine which of those three it was. After the lunar missions, and after a decade of analyzing those lunar samples, it was determined that none of the three were. And we came up with a new model. That model persists to this day, and that is that the moon was created by a Mars-sized body that struck the Earth about four and a half billion years ago. That model is a direct result of the samples that the astronauts brought back. And finally, it's worth mentioning that the moon was our very first opportunity, other than the Earth, to ground test uh, the, the remote sensing that was done from orbit. Before the Apollo missions, we had put a number of spacecraft in orbit around the moon that had studied the surface of the moon, studied the geology of the moon, and here was an opportunity to, to actually go down to the surface and test to see how good we were at judging geology from, the surf, from, from, from in space. Um, there were some interesting successes in the Apollo program and some really interesting failures. But almost all of our planetary exploration since the Apollo age has drawn on the lessons that we learned from Apollo of doing remote sensing and then actually landing on the surface to see if we were right. Finally, it's worth considering the inspirational legacy of Apollo. Uh, the first inspirational legacy was a distinct change in how the public viewed the Earth, based largely on the Earthrise image from Apollo 8. So we're going to bring up the Earthrise image behind me, probably the most famous image to come out of the, the, the space program. Wilderness photographer Galen Roswell called it the most influential environmental photograph ever taken. Apollo 8 astronaut Bill Anders, who took the photograph, said that it was the most beautiful thing he'd ever seen. He continues to go on to say, we came all this way to explore the moon, and the most important thing that we discovered was the Earth. <laughs> it's no accident that the first Earth Day happened in 1970, just after uh, this, this image was taken, two years after this image was taken. Actually, I guess a year and a half after this image was taken. The last, and I think possibly the most important legacy of the Apollo program, is that it inspired multiple generations of young women and men to pursue careers in science, uh, technology, and engineering. This is the legacy that's most important to me. Because I'm one of those children that grew up memorizing the names of every single astronaut, the mission they were on, what they did, why they did it. I've read every book on Apollo, and I've dreamt that I, too, could someone that some could one day explore the unknown. Um, we saw the great things that science and technology could accomplish, and we all wanted to be a part of the next great mission. Um, this, I believe, is the most enduring legacy of Apollo, that thousands upon thousands of people have been inspired to pursue careers in science and engineering. And I believe, ultimately, this will be its most significant impact on the world. So, thank you.